Hi everyone, glad to see us on your channel. Today we will listen to the fifth part of the memoirs of Francois de Joffre, one of the French pilots who fought on the Soviet-German front in the Volunteer Aviation Regiment, Normandy Nimmen, from May 1944 to the day of the surrender of Nazi Germany. We are on a former German airbase. The houses, barrack style, are carefully camouflaged. In them we find comforts that no soldier in France ever had. The concrete runway is excellent. Our airplanes are well sheltered, the mechanics, and we are satisfied. Immediately upon arrival, Delfino warns us, be careful. The Russians reported that everything around is mined. Caution first. The bomb squad will go through first. I don't want another Manso among you. But in spite of the warning, we go at once to inspect the hangars, which are full of airplanes of various types and of various ages. There are a lot of planes for tourism, but among them, we unexpectedly find Messerschmitt 108s in excellent condition. We could really use this to get back to Paris, Marshy tells me. Imagine that now someone is stuffed with aperitifs at home, and instead of aperitifs, we have the right only to a lid snack, with which we are generously treated by German anti-aircraft gunners. Of course, it was tempting to return to Paris on wings and plunge at once into the turmoil of a Sunday afternoon, which Parisians have the gift of turning into an unforgettable holiday. But enough of this dreaming. Front life goes on. Heavy losses, successes, true and false rumors. Here is everywhere, today is yesterday. We are so familiar with this life of military pilots, at once monotonous and intense. At Wittenberg, Reverchen was thoroughly battered by anti-aircraft artillery. His comrades, Sauvage, Marky, Luglov, also get their share of shrapnel. Despite this, Marshy and Reverchen decide to complete the mission at any cost, but suddenly an 80 millimeter shell hits the cockpit of Reverchen's plane. His right leg is broken, an open wound on his arm, dozens of scratches on his forehead and on the back of his head. Blood runs in streams. Reverchen realizes he's about to lose consciousness. With one last effort, he manages to take off the gas. Then he makes a U-turn, steeply descends, and at a speed of 180 kilometers per hour makes an emergency landing. The impact throws him out of the cabin more than 50 meters. He is lucky. He falls just a few steps away from the tents of the Soviet Red Cross. He is immediately placed on an operating table. The Russian doctors consider his condition hopeless, but very persistently and conscientiously attend to him, fighting doggedly for his life. This is striking, as death to military doctors is a thing to which no one pays attention. Blood transfusion after transfusion, operation after operation, this case is one of the miracles of the Insterberg Hospital, when Reverchon's iron health and his unyielding will to survive helped Soviet medicine to achieve an amazing success. Today Reverchon, with an amputated leg and an inflexible arm, still drives airplanes. March 19 at dawn from the direction of Königsberg comes a fierce cannonade. At the command post Major Vdovin familiarizes us with the situation at the front. The Germans are making desperate efforts to break the ring of encirclement around Königsberg and connect with units located south of the city, thus equalizing the front line. What can I say? I notice after the words of the Major. The Germans are still strong enough. They'll make us suffer a lot of grief. The next day, as if to confirm my words, six of our yaks were attacked by 12 Messers, including six Mi-109-G. They were piloted by exceptionally experienced pilots. Maneuvers of the Germans were distinguished by such clarity, as if they were on the exercise. Messerschmitt's 109 slash G thanks to a special system of fuel mixture enrichment, quietly enter a steep peak, which pilots call deadly. Here they break away from the rest of the Messers, and we do not have time to open fire, as they suddenly attack us from behind. Blayton is forced to jump out with a parachute. He no sooner touches the ground than he is taken prisoner. Blayton is sent to Pilaw, where he is interrogated by Colonel Brendel, commander of the 3rd Fighter Group, which included the famous German aces, 
The nose of their planes was painted yellow, and on the fuselage painted the ace of spades. Monsieur, this is my 100th victory, Brendel said boastfully. You're French from the Normandy, aren't you? Perhaps you are familiar with these two objects. Blayton immediately recognized the cockade worn by our pilots and a small medallion with a photograph. It was all Erebarns. The steel cockade was all wrinkled and flattened. We bought the medallion together in Cairo. Erebarn wore it around his neck. Colonel Brendel left the room for a moment. Taking advantage of this, Blayton quickly stashed the cockade and medallion in his pocket. When he returned, the colonel pretended not to have noticed anything. Blayton survived several terrible bombardments that almost completely destroyed Pillaw. Evacuated on a fast sea boat, he finds himself in Mecklenburg, from where, taking advantage of the panic, he manages to escape and join the advancing Russian army. On the day of the end of hostilities, Blayton flew to Heiligenbale and brought back some relics dear to me, a cockade and a medallion. Our losses in men and equipment are so significant that Major Delfino decides to transfer the regiment to a two-squadron formation. Matris becomes his deputy, and the two of them have under their command only 24 pilots and three interpreters, if you do not count the graduate student Romer, who serves as notary of the regiment and deals, in particular, correspondence with relatives of dead pilots and our relations with the BO. On February 24, the Normandy celebrated the awarding of the Order of the Battle Red Banner to the regiment. On that day, I met my old friend Emmet Khan, twice hero of the Soviet Union, the famed King of the Ram. We spend a few hours together, and I listen with great interest to this short man, with thick black curly hair, knocked out from under a dashingly folded scribbled cap. Everything about him is unusually expressive and picturesque. His voice, his face, his gestures, and even his cavalry gallivants, very wide at the top and tight at the calves, tucked into black boots made of soft leather. His name is extremely popular in the Soviet Union. One can listen for weeks to stories about his many exploits. Since the beginning of the war, he has made more than 500 combat sorties and shot down 20 enemy airplanes. February 25, we move to Friedland, where we are housed in the estate of a Prussian baron, killed on the Eastern Front. The park and lawns serve as a flying field for us. Believe me, this will not bring us luck, repeated incessantly little Munch, but he was silenced. The present did not seem so brilliant that we could afford such a luxury as to fear for our future. Sauvage, Marquis, Pierrot, and I look around Friedland. Pierrot knows German well and serves as our interpreter. The population is terrified. For the first time, we see German women and children. They look at us with horror. It is difficult to define our feelings towards them. There is both pity and indifference. More often, we start with indifference, which then turns into pity. Near one of the houses, Piero points to a plaque. He reads aloud, Higher want Napoleon I, 4 to 15 June 1807. Here in Friedland, we learn from Russian pilots about the return to action of Colonel Golubov. They also tell us about the heroic deed of two of their comrades from the 139th Guards Regiment. One of them was forced to land on the ice-covered Frischgaff. German soldiers rushed to the plane to take the pilot prisoner, but his comrade, who was in the air, began to circle around the plane in trouble and pour fire on those who dared to go out on the ice. At the same time, he radioed for help. He was soon spotted by four yaks. A potu arrived and took on board the pilot from the downed plane. Under the protection of Soviet fighters, potu took to the air and returned safely to the base. On March 20, General Petit, his daughter, General Zakharov, and Levendovich come to us. They bring us orders, orders for new ranks and mail. To the battle banner, Normandy Nemen, pin the order of the red banner. Read out the names of those awarded by the Supreme Soviet of the USSR Soviet orders. The names of the living alternate with the names of the dead, Kazanov, Erebarn, Michael, Verdier, Kernet, Gaston, Penvern. The French Order of Military Cross is awarded to a group of Soviet mechanics and Lieutenant Yakubov, flight gunner, 
who in October last year at Antonov saved Ingmol, hit, like him, in aerial combat. The ceremony was followed by a banquet organized for us by the BO. After the banquet, we learned that Captain Matras is leaving for Tula, where he will take command of a new fighter group of 17 pilots who have just arrived in Russia. The weather begins to improve. March 26, the four of us, Sauvage, Street Marceau, Sheris, and I, are engaged in battle over Pilaw. The anti-aircraft artillery of the Germans is beating relentlessly, not caring a little that it may hit their own. 20 minutes after the start of the fight, I, paired with Sauvage, win my last victory. Two Fock Wolves rushed at us. With all my might I take the handle and give full throttle. It took no more than six seconds for the Yak to make a combat turn. Sauvage and I are now on the tail of the Fock Wolves. Our machine guns and cannons drilled, cut to pieces both planes, which fall in the heart of the bay, raising columns of water. Slow barrel over the airfield. A triumphant return. Congratulations. A double shot of vodka. Everything seemed to be going well. Nothing said that the next day, March 27, I would undergo the toughest ordeal of my life. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. That morning, we are all outside our airplanes, wearing helmet phones, flight suits, parachutes strapped on, cigarettes in our teeth. A joke is ready to burst from everyone's lips, waiting for the rocket, the signal for takeoff. An alarming, oppressive silence reigns in the air. It's as if nature itself is waiting for something, frozen in tension. And only in the east, some 40 kilometers away from us, a muffled but increasing rumble says that the battle for the possession of the Königsberg sack and the Zemlin Peninsula has begun. The decisive assault begins with a terrible rumble that takes us by surprise every time. We all relive the beginning of the majestic battle. We see again those monstrous tongues of fire and steel spewed up to the sky by the solid forest of guns. We see the airplanes covering the whole sky. We see the heavy Russian tanks grinding everything with their steel tracks, advancing forward and destroying the last miraculously surviving pockets of resistance. And finally, we see the infantry, which swiftly, with a battle cry, goes into the attack and in hand-to-hand -hand combat kills those who did not have time to destroy the murderous fire of shells and bombs. We have already witnessed so many battles that there is no need to strain the imagination to visualize the terrible picture of the fighting around the capital of Prussia. The hour of retribution is at hand. A sharp whistle cuts through the air. A green sparkling balloon takes off rapidly at the command post into the too bright sky and lazily descends, as if anxious for the inexorable order given and as if wishing, before it is too late, to prevent a terrible and fatal inevitability. The pilots hurry to get into their machines. Mechanics and gunners rush to start the engines. 32 engines roar almost simultaneously in such a way that their steel throats seem about to burst. Wing to wing, the first links lift off the ground, raising a terrible whirlwind of dust. In this whirlwind almost invisible to take off the following links. In the air airplanes pair by pair make a small turn, allowing the rest to join them and take their place in the battle order. Course, 275, altitude. 3,000, speed, 480, regiment, Normandy. Neiman, led by Delfino, goes to fulfill the combat mission. The order is to block the airfield in Pulau, the last refuge of the squadron melders, uniting the color of the pilots of the German fighter aviation. Pilaw is the last military port of East Prussia, a grim sentry, frozen at the post at the entrance to the narrow strait. There we are waiting for experienced pilots on the Focke-Wolfs and Messers of the latest models. Hardened by five years of continuous aerial combat, they are ready for anything and prefer death to defeat. We are also determined and also want to win or die. Together with three pilots of my squadron, I go on the right flank of the group. We have to cover the main core of the group. In the milky white sky, layered clouds float by, thinning as we approach the sea. It's been 10 minutes since we've been in flight. 
In the distance, we can see Frisch Gaff Bay, Pillau, and the airfield. The melders are already here, as if they've arrived for a rendezvous. In groups of two planes, they cluster over each other and fill the sky at all altitudes, a flexible tactic that is most profitable for them. I'm paired with Captain Sherez, separating from the squadron and heading down toward Pillau. A slight wiggling of the wings of the airplane of the regimental commander. The signal to attack in the air is heard incessantly. Axtung, Franzosen, almost in a steep peak to reach a speed of 600 kilometers per hour, we rush to the ground. A pair of Fock Wolves flying perpendicular to the line of our flight, but much lower. All eyes on the scope. Let's go. A little luck, a little accuracy, and we'll cause them a lot of trouble. But the Fock Wolves have understood our maneuver. They start to turn around, roll over on their backs, and swiftly dive towards their airfield, using all the power of their engines. They want to drag us behind them to expose us to the deadly fire of their anti-aircraft artillery. My position is not the best. In a dizzying dive, I found myself closest to the ground. With record speed, I am approaching one of the Fock Wolves, clearly distinguishing the black crosses on the wings. Well, it's time. A light pressure on the control pedal. The silhouette of the airplane is growing. It's getting clearer and clearer in the sighting frame. And now my tracer bullets catch up with it, tearing off pieces of metal from the hull. Grayish smoke slides along the fuselage, but the fighter continues to dive. Suddenly I see that I am alone in the sky above the airfield, just a few hundred meters from the sea. I feel the anti-aircraft artillery concentrating fire on my yak. Fireballs of various colors and purple streaks surround me. German tracer bullets mix with mine and paint bizarre patterns in the sky. A familiar crackle is heard in my headphones. Attention. Rebuilding at altitude 3000. Direction. Hylogen Bale. Informs. Finocero. Our link scattered, or rather evaporated, and I am now all alone in a hostile sky, at a height of 500 meters from the ground, surrounded by black clouds of ruptures, like lambs with curly wool. With great difficulty, I manage to gain altitude. I keep my course to the east in order not to be late to join the group at the place indicated by the commander. I zigzag to get rid of possible pursuit. To the left and above my yak, at 10 o'clock two Fock Wolves are waiting for me. At four o'clock two Messerschmitt 109s fly by. I rush at great speed to the ground covered by clouds. It already seems to me that I will manage to get out of this mess unharmed, as suddenly a bright flash blinds me. My car goes into a spasm. There's smoke. The floor of the cabin is gone. Under my feet I see the sea in flames that seem to be about to lick my boots. I realize I've been hit. Some fock wolf, coming out of the clouds above me, got into the tail of my yak and fired several rounds at point-blank range. The shells exploded in the tail of the machine and under it. That's all I have time to realize so far. And while I'm trying to visualize more clearly what happened, suddenly a second explosion shakes the plane. My yak goes into a tailspin. The controls are out of control. There's nothing more I can do. He falls on the left wing, turns over on his back, and enters the first turn of the corkscrew, which leaves no chance for salvation. The car is on fire. It falls into the sea like a blazing and smoking head. Almost mechanically, as if in a delirium, I open the cabin lantern, which is immediately blown away by the airstream, unbuckle the harness, and with inhuman effort rise from the seat. The corkscrew turns are more and more frequent, the flames raging more and more violently. For a moment I see the sea surging beneath me. I close my eyes, tense my muscles, and a sense of peace and quiet immediately overwhelms me. For a moment, nausea comes to my throat, so sharply have I torn the ring of the parachute. And there I am, dangling in the air. But in what a ridiculous position. One leg is tangled in the parachute slings, and I'm falling almost upside down. Apparently, the parachute opened unsuccessfully, and the dome above me is half crumpled. 
After desperate efforts, I finally manage to assume an almost normal position. For some time, I feel a strong, chilling wind on me, and then quickly plunged into the gray-green, viscous, enveloping the body of the world. A feeling of piercing cold, suffocation, lingering fear of nothingness. No sky, no air. I am suffocating, almost unconscious, at a depth of six meters in the Frisch Gaff Bay, which has been free of ice for no more than two weeks. A thought drills into my brain. Save myself, save myself at all costs. Calling on my good past, my athletic conditioning, I frantically work my arms and legs and soon find myself on the surface of the water. I gulp greedily, the air, I feel better. The nightmarish cycle of thoughts and memories gradually stops in my mind. Now, first of all, it is necessary to get rid of the straps and slings of the parachute, unnecessary equipment, and as soon as possible to swim away from this huge white shroud, which constricts my movements and pulls me into the abyss of the sea. I feel a slight tingling sensation in my right leg, probably a few small pieces of shrapnel lodged in my foot. My hip hurts. I lost one boot while falling into the water, the other dragging me to the bottom like a heavy diver's shoe. Despite the shock, my movements become more and more sensible. I realize that the dome of my parachute floating on the surface of the bay makes an excellent target for the Germans. Somehow I make the first swings to float away, and at the same time in the sky continue to circle Messers. They send several machine gun bursts at me. We do the same thing though. There's no telling. This is war. Two to three kilometers away from me, the shore is clearly outlined. It is still in the hands of the Germans, who meter by meter continue to retreat under the powerful onslaught of Russian troops. But nevertheless, I swim to the shore, trying to coordinate my movements, to give them a calm, measured rhythm, and continuing to look at the outlines of the Zemlin Peninsula. I swim slowly, saving my strength. I look around and soon I notice a dark object floating on the surface 100 meters to my right. Slowly, very slowly, losing stability under the weight of swollen clothes, bruised and frozen to the bone. I approach this object, my last hope, as I feel that without support I will never reach the shore. It takes me about 10 minutes to cover the last meters. I am completely exhausted. Cramps of iron hoops tighten my legs and back, when at last I grasp, with unbending fingers, a thick wooden bar to which two small planks are nailed. Breath and life come back to me. I tell myself that if I can stay on top of this bar, I will not be shared again today in the regiment. I close my eyes. I am so tired, so tired. When I lift my eyelids, I see bullets splashing all around me, as if hail were falling. I'm being shot at from the shore. I settle down behind a log, trying to get away from the eyes of those who like to shoot at fixed targets. And, indeed, the fire gradually subsides. They must have thought I was drowned, that I was dead. But am I not half dead already? I'm turning blue. I scream in pain, clearly feeling the bloody daggers of the deadly cold stabbing into my body. I'm terrified. I'd rather die from a bullet than freeze to death in the water. I scramble up onto the beam. The sun has set. The sky has turned from white to steel gray. Air battles continue over the bay. A group of P-2 bombers in close formation is bombing the tip of the peninsula. This is the only thing that gives me satisfaction. I watch with pleasure as bunches of black dots fall in hail to the ground, where immediately rise huge columns of flame playing with all colors, from red-yellow to purple. But here comes the turn of the attack planes, the formidable Russian planes that bring death and destruction. They pass no more than 50 meters above me. Their guns pour fire on ships, boats and rafts that are trying to sail away from the shore, where the fires are raging. A scattered, helpless, roaring mass of people perish in the center of the gigantic whirlpools formed by the explosions of bombs and shells, and only bloody stains remain on the surface of the water. What time is it? I have lost all sense of time and space. An insignificant, pathetic creature, almost without life and without thought, 
What force makes you cling to this piece of wood? What will makes you believe in a miracle when logic and reason would say it's all over? I fall into oblivion, come to my senses, mumble something, and fall into oblivion again. Night. A cold fog has risen over the Baltic. But the war doesn't stop for a minute. The shells are tearing incessantly, and I hear them whistling and whistling terribly in the sky, as if somewhere the bellows of the infernal forge were breathing. Sometimes the sea is shaken by explosions that break the waves, turning them into raging ripples. The flames of the explosions split the night darkness. I no longer know whether I am dead or alive, nor do I feel that I am witnessing one of the fiercest bloody battles between the Russians and the Germans. Suddenly a dark spot appears in the fog, gradually taking the shape of a man clutching, like me, at some plank. He is as pathetic and miserable as I am. What is he? Russian or German? A pilot? Infantryman? An artilleryman? He, like me, can no longer speak. He, like me, is no longer able to make a single movement. And yet his presence brings me relief. It gives me confidence, encourages me. And as the fog swallows up that vague silhouette of a stranger, I feel doomed again. As if in a delirium, I see my loved ones, my father and my family, my friends and squadron mates, images of my distant homeland, vague and vague, haunt me unceasingly. I almost lose consciousness, and only by a miracle do not fall from my perch. When I come to my senses, I see a German tank half submerged in the water, spitting out all its guns, and the Kadiushas joining in this Dante symphony. The light current has brought me closer to the shore, so that I can now easily determine my position in relation to the advance of the Russians and the retreat of the Germans. I am exactly on the axis of the neutral zone. With the help of a piece of wood fished out of the water, which I use as a paddle, I manage to speed up my progress somewhat. Sometimes a compulsive acute desire overwhelms my chest, which feels like it is bursting with bleeding wounds. I think, I've had enough. I don't want anything more. It is worth only a little week in my hands, and I will just, without suffering, soundly fall asleep. But this thought is fought by another, the same burning and irresistible, returning with the regularity of a pendulum. Well, no, you'll get out of it. The worst is over. While the forces of death and life are fighting within me, around me the battle between them continues with even greater fierceness. From my shelter, I watch the world perish. This cruel, blood-stained world that I am beginning to truly hate. Soon a new challenge begins for me. In one of the brief moments of calm, I distinctly recognize the distinctive noise of a diesel engine. It comes from the sea, right behind me. It is, of course, a fast German sea boat from Pilla, which, taking advantage of the fog and darkness, is making its last desperate raid before escaping to Denmark. Now the noise of the engine can be heard so close that I feel as if the boat is about to hit a beam. I crane my neck and stick my eyes into the darkness and fog, but I can't see anything. Suddenly, Shots ring out just a few meters away from me, and tracer shells fly literally over my head toward the shore. It is the Germans firing their last shells at the Russians. Having finished firing, the ghost ship heads back the way it came. I hear the steady hum of its engine, which gradually subsides. I am alone again, but now I revel in that solitude. This ordeal, instead of finishing me off, has strengthened my hope for apprehension. Providence, which has not deserted me hitherto, cannot but help me now that I am so near my goal. For more than 10 hours now I have been in the water. The slightest effort becomes a torture. My joints no longer bend. My muscles refuse to obey. I'm torn to pieces with pain. My right leg is aching terribly. When the pain becomes unbearable, I scream into the darkness, joining my pitiful cry of a wounded man to the rumble of battle and the splash of the sea waves. I have lost all sense of cold. My teeth no longer clatter. My jaws are clenched tight as if by a cramp. I'm burning with wild thirst. I shriek in pain, but I keep paddling with the piece of plank. The shore is close now. 
and it frightens me. In the glow of the fires, in the light of the rockets, I can make out all the details of the devilish dance that is taking place on the shore. People crawl, suddenly rise, throw grenades, disappear. Others appear in their place, they run, waving their arms like marionettes dancing against the underworld. The Russian artillery is firing direct fire, almost at point-blank range. The last German soldiers are shooting back, standing in the water, defending already only their honor as warriors. But my feverish, wandering eye and elusive consciousness have little perception of these strange pictures. What is to be done? Swim to the left, or perhaps to the right. How to find out? First we must get ashore, and then we'll see. Just don't drown. I can't imagine myself drowning. Another 200 meters. One more effort, damn it. Mechanically, I continue to plunge the improvised paddle and pull it out of the water, each time asking myself if I can repeat the motion again. Another 100 meters to go. Again, bullets whistle around me, certainly without a dress, but also dangerous. On the precipitous bank shells burst continuously, raising sheaves of sparks, rubble, and mud into the air. The flames of the fires formed a scarlet red crown in the sky. It seems that death is about to engulf the entire earth. I urged myself, as one urges a hunted horse. Come on, Francois, the goal is near. You won't fall 10 meters from where you were rescued. You don't have to die. You know very well that you must not die. Maybe I really was nothing more than a bleeding, half-dead animal at that moment. But that animal was bound to life by invisible threads. Perseverance wins. There it is, the shore, a few meters away from me. I fumble with my right hand for some bridges on stilts. I force myself to take a full breath. Now, without wasting a second, I must shout, shout in Russian. Otherwise, I risk getting a machine gun or machine gun fire. That would be very foolish. We mustn't miss the slightest opportunity. At the first pause, when the machine guns deign to be silent even for a few seconds, I must make myself known. In Russian, of course. The Russians must have a foothold on the shore by now. I think I can already make out their fur hats, long overcoats, and automatic rifles with round discs. The noise is fading. It's time. I shout. My scream has nothing to do with humanity. It is rather an animal roar, an animal manifestation of the instinct of self-preservation. Comrades, here is a French pilot of the Normandy Nimen Regiment. I'm wounded. I have the strength for one more such desperate call. A flare flashes in the sky. I wave my hand, shout something incoherent one last time, and exhausted, sink down on the bridges. My eyes are open, but I can't see anything else. Another shout, but this time from the side of the Russians. Some soldier rushes to the water. He holds out his hand, pulls me to shore. I fall to the sand. My savior is in a hurry. The German machine gunners are not far away. They are coming the shore. I find myself in a shell crater crowded with Soviet soldiers. The offensive is in full swing. Unshaven faces peer at me curiously. My heart beats. I'm alive, but I can't utter another word. The Soviet captain examines me. He notices the order of the patriotic war on my ragged tunic. His face lights up with a smile. He leans over and kisses me firmly. This gesture will remain forever in my memory as the highest expression of friendship of soldiers fighting for a common cause, as an exciting expression of feelings, which allows you to forget for a while all the horrors of war. One of the soldiers tries to shove the neck of a vodka flask into my mouth. From the very first sips of it, an immense warmth spreads all over my body, but almost instantly I faint in the arms of my Soviet friends under the rumble of guns and machine guns. The offensive was coming to an end. The relentless and formidable Red Army was destroying and dumping into the Frisch Gaff the last remnants of what had once been German armies in Belarusia. I later learned that an hour after I was rescued, the offensive was over. The Russian troops had reached the extreme point of the peninsula. The encircled German grouping was liquidated. A complete victory has been won, but the losses on both sides are enormous. 
When I came to my senses, it was already light. Everything was shrouded in a damp, penetrating fog. Wrapped in a blanket, I was lying in a cart on straw, next to the severely wounded Soviet soldiers. Every jolt was accompanied by strong groans. We were being taken to the infirmary. The road was not easy in this desert covered with ashes, among piles of still smoking ruins and burning houses. At last we reached the infirmary, the first bandages, the first injections, life begins again. For eight days I was kept in the sorting hospital in Heilsburg, where thousands of Russian soldiers were being treated. The nurses, doctors and the deputy colonel took care of me in every possible way. On the day I was brought in, my bunkmate, a Soviet infantry captain, turned to me and asked, Comrade pilot, when and where were you shot down? Over Frischgaff, opposite the village of Rosenbaum, I jumped out with a parachute on March 27 at 9 hours and 30 minutes in the morning. I can see his face tense up. He remembers something. And then, squeezing my hands to the point of pain, he says, So it was you I saw jumping from the blazing yak that morning when my company attacked the Germans. I even thought to myself, Well, there goes another one. In Friedland, too, they thought the Baron had already flown away. The regiment gave me a touching welcome. Division headquarters was going to present me for the award of the Order of Lenin. But the most important thing for me was something else, and I immediately asked, Well, how was that day? What were the results? Marshy answered me, Yes, we shot down four, but Shawl and Monge didn't come back. Guido and Merzison sat on their bellies in the field, hit by anti-aircraft guns. Tough day, one of the hardest of the war. That night, I can assure you, no one had any desire to joke around. Of course, my lock-in came too. He shook my hand firmly, and without saying a word, sat down on the bed. Well, Lockin, are you happy to see me? You again remained without an airplane. Smiling, he answered me. Nothing, Lieutenant. We leave Friedland and move to Bledio, a town located on the banks of the Frisch Gaff, south of Königsberg, opposite the coastal fortifications of Pula, which is still in the hands of the Germans. I move about with difficulty. It is impossible to walk without a stick, as the pain in my leg causes great suffering. I follow the regiment in one of the transport planes with our mechanics and baggage. There is now a noticeable shortage of airplanes and, most sadly, pilots. The airfield at Bladio is situated on a gentle slope near the sea. From the command post is clearly visible coastal fortifications, the port of Pala and the factory in Zimabuda. Sorties are resumed immediately. We accompany the attack on Konigsberg and Pala. The Russians put in the air all their aviation available to them in the area, Ketiusha. The menace of the German army participate in the concert at the same time as the artillery. But the Germans still do not capitulate. It seems silly to us. Since April 8, we have been under artillery fire every day. The German batteries are stationed on the opposite shore, on a narrow seaside spit. We will apparently have to endure everything during the Russian campaign. The regimental commander orders us to hastily dig shelter trenches and prepare an observation post. A soldier with binoculars keeps a constant watch. He reports the beginning of shelling. Thus, we have 20 to 30 seconds to take cover. Königsberg continues to resist. It is said that the SS men leading the defense are shooting every retreating soldier. We learn that there, in one of the German concentration camps, collected more than 10,000 French prisoners of war. Only on the night of April 9, the garrison of the city finally capitulates. Königsberg, the fortress, the capital of Prussia, is devastated and defeated. And for us, the war continues. The batteries on the other side of the river are still silent. We look at the attack planes that are supposed to destroy them, but the raid fails to reach its target. There's discontent among the Normandy Neiman pilots. Only this is not enough to let themselves be destroyed by artillery fire. The gasoline storage tank is damaged, and the returning planes are forced to land at Heiligenbeil. Delfino gives short orders. Marquis, Duar, Street Maru, and Henry. 
You are to shell the last fortifications on the spit where fighting is still going on. The Russians are approaching Pilaw. They should be on the outskirts of the city by now. This is the last battle of the Normandy Nemen. Henry shot down in it his next opponent, Focwolf, thus inscribing 273rd victory on the combat account of our regiment. Well done, Henry. You beautifully dealt with your fifth crot, said his friends. Henry smiles. He is proud of this victory. He dreams of returning to his homeland. His old mother is waiting for him impatiently. Suddenly, the observer shouts, Attention, comrades. Everyone rushes to the trenches. Shells are whistling. A strong explosion throws us to the ground. When the rumbling stops, we all get up and clean ourselves up. And only Henry, to whom I spoke a moment ago, has not gotten up. He's lying stretched out next to the trench. Delfino, Cheris, and Desol rush to him and carry him under fire to the shelter. Henry is alive. He says quietly to Major Delfino, Nothing. I'll survive. Don't worry. I'm not going anywhere from you now. The back of his head is bleeding. He was wounded by a shell fragment in the head. A few hours later, on the Major's instructions, I arrive at the hospital to find out about my comrade's condition, but find him dying on a hospital bed. It's a real nightmare. The next day, Henry dies in the hospital after an operation that could no longer help him. Two days later, Henry is buried with the Soviet soldiers who fell in the last battles. We go to see Konigsberg, or rather its ruins. As if a gigantic earthquake had happened here, everything is ruined, burned, destroyed. The air smells of gunpowder, ashes, and death. Endless columns of German prisoners are moving eastward. It is said that there are over 8,000 of them. They are going feral, indifferent to everything, more sturdy supporting the wounded. They are going to the Soviet Union to rebuild with their own hands what they destroyed with their guns. There are all sorts of rumors among us. They're fighting already in Berlin. Berlin is under fire from Russian artillery. Hitler has escaped. No, he committed suicide. From hour to hour, we are expecting news of a meeting between the East and the West. It is known that it should take place near Dresden on the Elbe. April 25, the Red Army strikes the last blow on the fortress of Pula. Two squadrons to Pula. Major Delfino gives the order. They report that there are still a few Fock Wolves in the air. The enemy does not leave us without saying goodbye. I'm begging the commander to let me make this last sortie. My leg is much better. If my mechanic can help me up to the cockpit, everything will be all right. I think I was eloquent enough. Major Delfino agrees. The last combat flight of our regiment has just begun. In the Air 20 Yak, here we are over Pilaw. Enemy planes are not seen. Weak fire anti-aircraft artillery, the last convulsions of the dying. Fighting is already in the streets of the city, here, and there burst shells on the ground and in the water. Soviet tanks are moving, accompanied by assault squads of formidable infantry units. On the way back, I fly over Frischgaff and over my life-saving shoal. At noon, Pilav is already in the hands of the Red Army. East Prussia has fallen. On April 27, there was a meeting of the Allies at Torgo, on the Elbe. We're relocating for a change. We have to keep traditions. For the 30th time, there are road preparations. Maybe this will finally be the last time. In two flights, we fly to Elbing, a city located in the south of Prussia, on the way to Danzig. On May 8, we uncork bottles of champagne to celebrate the victory. Gentlemen, the war is over, shout the French. Comrades, the war is over. In Berlin signed an act of unconditional surrender. Let's celebrate this great event. The Russians answer us. 80 degree alcohol is flowing in rivers. That evening Blitten, who was a prisoner of war in Pula, suddenly appears. He crossed part of East Germany in a potu. Well, Blitten, what do you think of Pula? It was hot, wasn't it? You can't imagine what the Germans and I had to endure. Fortunately, they had the good idea to evacuate me by boat. 
Otherwise, I would hardly have been able to taste the champagne in honor of the victory. In Elping, we are waiting for orders from Moscow. Albert and De La Poigues are returning from France. You know Albert, says Marky. We missed you in Prussia and you too, Vicomte. It was a tidbit, but it was often hard to digest. You could have ended the war twice hero of the Soviet Union. You're right, old boy. But spending a few months in Paris after two years away is not bad either. The days in Elbing passed like a holiday. At last, after numerous tragicomic, mostly comic, incidents connected with fraternizing with the fair sex of Germany, after a series of orders and orders canceling them, the great day of departure for Moscow came. But it was an agonizing day. We were parting with our mechanics, with our yaks. Even the toughest of us could not hide our tears. And now in transport planes we were flying the route we had traveled for three years. Prussia, Lithuania, Neiman, Poland, Berezina, Belarusia. After five and a half hours of flight, we see Moscow, jubilant and victorious. We are met by General Petit, Colonel Poyad, Lieutenant Colonel Delfino, and Major Mattress. You will be accommodated in the hotel of the Central House of the Red Army. Until June 5, you are free to dispose of your time. Our first thought, our first endeavor, is to visit the Moscow Cemetery. Only after piles of wreaths have been laid on the still fresh graves of De Jord, Bourdieu, Lefebvre, and our other comrades, did we set out to walk around Moscow, celebrating the victory. Days and nights are full of merriment. We don't go to bed. Besides, in June, the night lasts only a few hours. For us, the sun always shone. Destinate, come with me to the cocktail lounge. I have a date. Let's go to Aragvi. The Soviet pilots are inviting us. Friends, I just sold my watch. Let's go to the Moscow restaurant one more night. These four days were the most intoxicating and at the same time the most exhausting of all our experiences. Worse than the Baltic, Marshy once remarked. In this frenzy, we even forgot that June 5 we should be awarded orders. The ceremony took place in the central hall of the House of the Red Army. The whole building was flooded with bright electric light. A grandiose in scale lavish banquet united Soviet and French generals, Soviet diplomats around the subdued, but intoxicated with joy regiment Normandy Nimmin. Andrew was awarded the title of hero of the Soviet Union. Mattress receives the order of Alexander Nesky. The other pilots are awarded the order of the Red Banner of Combat and the Patriotic War. During the banquet, Delfino makes a sign to me. Baron, come here, they want to talk to you. To my great amazement, I see Air Chief Marshal Novikov. Commander-in-Chief of the Soviet Aviation, the one who led the Soviet Air Army to victory. He is waiting for me, standing with a glass in his hand. Comrade de Joffre, I'd like to have a drink with you. They call you the man from the Baltic. Let's drink to the man from the Baltic. Blushing with embarrassment, I drink with the marshal a huge crystal glass of wine. I thank the marshal for his attention, and together with him, I proclaim a toast to the victory of the Red Army and to Stalin's health. The next day, the stunning news brings everyone out of the state of extreme fatigue that had accumulated since our arrival in Moscow. We are returning to France in our combat airplanes. Marshal Stalin hands us our yaks. It was true. General de Gaulle sent Marshal Stalin the following telegram. In view of the fact that the fighting in Europe is over, I ask you to transfer to the disposal of the French Aviation Regiment, Normandy Nemen. I take this opportunity to thank you once again for accepting French pilots into the ranks of the glorious Soviet aviation and supplying them with weapons to participate in battles against the Nazi enemy. The Brotherhood in Arms, thus cemented on the battlefields, appears in our victory as a reliable pledge of friendship of both peoples, Soviet and French, with greetings. Stalin answered him, Your message of June 2 received. French Aviation Regiment, Normandy Nemen, is in Moscow and ready to leave for France. On the Soviet side there was and is no reason to delay its departure for France. The regiment will go home in full armament, that is, with airplanes and air armament, 
by the route across the Elbe River and further west. I think it natural to retain for the regiment its material, which it has used on the Eastern Front with courage and complete success. Let it be a modest gift of the Soviet Union to the aviation of France and a symbol of the friendship of our peoples. Please accept my thanks for the good combat work of the regiment on the front of the fight against the German troops. In the evening, at a reception at the French Embassy, hosted by General Quatru, this news was announced officially. We return each on his own yak. Moreover, the Soviet government has decided to pay us in dollars as a gift for the time we have given to the front. On our behalf, the embassy refused to accept this gift. But the Russians insisted, and the money was handed over to us in Prague. There are still three more days to plunge back into the world of Moscow entertainment, to watch the soccer match between Leningrad and Moscow at the Stadium Dynamo, to formalize the marriage of Pilot Lauren with the beautiful Rita from Tula in 10 minutes. During these three days, I have time to get acquainted with a young student, a Ukrainian, who knew French literature much better than I did, to visit once again the restaurant Moscow, where I was mistaken for a Russian, to participate in a grand evening in the House of the Red Army, a few more times to visit the cocktail hall, and Mr. Champenoy from the French military mission, to visit the cinema, the Bolshoi Theater. During these three days, I had not a moment's rest, and on June 11, we are already flying to Elbing to pick up our yaks and those of the mechanics who will accompany the Normandy Nemen to Paris to relieve us of additional worries on the way. My faithful Lokjan will not be able to travel with me. On the day of departure, June 14, as I was climbing into my yak, he handed me a signed photo card and a small, modest bouquet of flowers. Thank you very much, dear Lokin. Goodbye. I quickly climbed into the cabin and waved goodbye to him one last time. Together we spent two years of war, and now we will never see each other again. General Zakharov, excited, like us, waves his handkerchief, personally signaled the departure of the now French 37 Yak Normandy Nimen, which he commanded for three years and led to victory. Takes off squadron after squadron. The route. Elbing, Poznan, then Prague, Stuttgart, a wide ribbon of the Rhine glistening in the sun. The French border, Street Dizier, and Paris. Be careful. Poyap warns us, don't abuse your speed. This is not the time to crash the plane or break your neck. In Stuttgart, we meet with our familiar pilots from the French fighter aviation groups. The first question of a thousand others that will be asked of us from now on. Well, how was the USR? How did you like Soviet life? The Red Army? The country? What are the people like there? What do they dream about? What do they eat? Here we were given a lavish reception by General de Lacter de Tassini. At the reception, I was surprised to meet my sister. And now, at last, we're in France. We land in Saint Désir where the first official formalities begin. June 20, Normandy Nimmin again takes to the air. At half past seven in the evening, I notice in the distance the spire of the Cathedral of Our Lady of Paris, the Seine, the Champs Elysees, and even further away, the majestic Arc de Triomphe. As if chained together by an invisible chain, 37 yaks with a tricolor nose with the Soviet emblem appear in the sky above Paris. In parade formation mighty, glorious squadrons fly over the Champs Elysees at a height of 500 meters. Above the monument to the unknown soldier they scatter in the sky, like a giant fan, covering Paris from the air. The Borgit airfield is black with welcomers. I say to myself, old chap, this is no time to wring your neck. I'm sure we're all thinking the same thing but I did have a little trouble with my brakes at the last minute during landing. Furious and cursing, I landed last, but just in time to get in line and receive the traditional bouquet of flowers. We were greeted by Paris, a jubilant nation, our homeland. She gave us a welcome the most delightful, the most touching of all the receptions a person can receive. A little apart from the group of greeters stood an old woman, simple and sad in her black attire. 
When the clamor of the crowd had somewhat subsided, she approached me as timidly as if she were afraid of something. Lieutenant, I'm very happy to see you. Weren't you a friend of my son's? He wrote to me so often about you in his letters. I didn't know what to say to her. Madame, your son was my comrade, my brother, my friend. He gave everything for victory. Not for a single moment did he forget you. A few days after that deafening noise of victory, I board the plane again. There is one note missing from this celebratory symphony. My family, my wife and daughter. The circle is closing. After leaving Casablanca, I return to Casablanca. At the airfield, a woman comes toward me, smiling and excited. Next to her is a little girl. Francois, you're back at last. I'm so happy. And here's our little girl. She was only two years old when you left. On that June evening in 1945, two men walked along the sandy shore of the seaside resort of Anfa, near Casablanca, keeping silence. Huge waves, as if made of dark velvet, with white laces of foam on their crests, were lapping at the hot sand of the beach. The sky, high and cloudless, all dotted with stars. The air was warm and soft. It was a peaceful night, the kind of night we had dreamed of thousands and thousands of times in the midst of the harsh Russian winter. For a long time, neither man nor woman dared to break this silence, which conceals something magical and enchanting. And only when the sky in the distance above the horizon began to pale, when the emerging day made itself known by the mysterious rustling of grasses, the man dared to say, you will understand me. It is difficult for me to express what I am thinking now. The comrades, the squadron, the battles, Russia, it was all wonderful. But if all these efforts were not understood or will not be understood in the future, then they are in vain. The woman did not answer anything, but she shook very firmly and for a long time the hand of her husband, who was not afraid of people, but who was afraid for humanity. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. Peaceful life turned out to be almost as cruel for the former pilots of Normandy Nimen as the war. After the triumphant return from Russia, life again scattered around the world people who were brought together by death or the presence of death into a single family. I have tried to tell you about the heroic life of the French volunteers of the Normandy Nimen Air Regiment during the Second World War. Later, maybe I will try to share with you about how we changed our military uniforms to civilian suits, how we started to live the life of ordinary people again. I will tell you how those died whom death itself seemed afraid to approach. Marky, Amarge, Imona, Morier, Limar, Uglov, Janelle, Cheris, Astir, Carbon, Pistrak, Merzizen. All of them were either in the military aviation service or in Indochina, or in the Civil Aviation Service. They continued to fly, staying true to their profession that they loved so much. They stayed true to it for the rest of their lives. I will also tell you how they tried, in spite of the affairs and vicissitudes of life, not to change their adored beloved, whose name is the thirst for exploits. I, too, continued on the dangerous and difficult road of adventure driven by the eternal, indefatigable desire to live intensely, to struggle, and to learn. I worked first on domestic airlines, then in Indochina, as a pilot on rubber plantations, and finally in Venezuela, as a pilot in a prospecting squadron engaged in gold and diamond exploration. I would like to close this book, which I hope, in spite of its imperfections, is a true and sincere testimony to the great exploits of the French with one story which I believe will give our past its true meaning and its true significance. In St. Anton, in Austria, in the winter of 1949, two French officers were skiing. They did not shine with any special ability in this sport, so one young Austrian, tanned with lively eyes, approached them and said, I am an instructor. Allow me to give you some tips. The officers agreed. A conversation ensued. They talked about skiing. They talked about Austria. They talked about the present. And ended, as one might expect, with reminiscences of the past. It was only then that the young instructor introduced himself. I am Captain Pep Gable, 
Former pilot of the 3rd Squadron Melders in East Prussia, I suppressed the swear word that was about to come out of my mouth. Damn it, that squadron stood against us. Are you pilots too? We were at least in the Normandy Niemann Regiment. Captain Pep Gabel smiled. So we stood against each other in Gumbinen and in Pila. Your yaks with the trickler nose caused us a lot of trouble. I'd be interested to know which of yours shot down our colonel, the famous Barenbrock, who had 140 victories. It was a brutal fight. I had to survive your raid on Heiligen Bale. It was early February, 1945. I was also in Pillow Hill, where I made my last sorties. For a few moments, we stood stunned, unable to utter a word. Then we laughed involuntarily. Before us stood one of our most dangerous adversaries in the past, a pilot from the squadron melders. We talked for a long time, still standing on skis. We recalled the battles, tactics, the merits of aircraft, victories, and defeats. I was very surprised, not finding even a word of hatred in myself, and felt like a player on a soccer team talking to a ball opponent. What would you do if you were me? A major conversation had taken place in the skies four years ago. Now we were standing on peaceful ground, and there was no need to rehash the past. It might prevent us from seeing the future. There was no reason to hate, no more point in teaching each other. I don't think that any of my fellow pilots who volunteered to go to Russia would have done anything differently than we did. On the contrary, I am sure they would have found the same meaning in this encounter as we did. In this newfound peace, they would have seen, as we did, a symbolic conclusion to the magnificent history of the Normandy Niemann Regiment.